Hello everyone, my name is Nick Mashinsky, and I am the host of A History of the Inca, where we cover the origin, rise, and eventual fall of one of the greatest pre-Columbian empires in the Americas. The Inca built roads that stretched nearly the length of South America, worshipped the sun, and governed an area the size of Rome at its height, all while having no written language, that we know of anyways. On the show we've covered pre-Inca cultures like the Moche, Nazca, Tiwanaku, and Wari, We've toured Machu Picchu, and we've marched with the Inca as they've traversed some of the most dangerous terrain the world has to offer. A History of the Inca is in English and now Spanish as well. You can find the show on most podcasting platforms or at our website, ahistoryoftheinca.wordpress.com. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa podcast. I'm your host, Andy. Last week, we concluded the reign of Izano the great king of Aksum, who changed the state religion to Christianity and expanded the Aksumite realm by conquering Nubia. His brother, and trusted general, Saizana, enjoyed a brief rule after his brother's death, before quickly passing away himself. Now, with the last of the brothers dead, rule passed to Mehadias, a man who would go down in history as Aksum's most religiously fervent monarch. Episode 19, The Zealot King and the Nine Saints. After Azana passed away in the early 360s, a man named Mehadias rose to the throne. His relationship with Saizana, or the rest of the royal family, is unknown. And historians aren't even necessarily certain where he fits in Aksum's succession. He may have been Azana or Saizana's son, or maybe an obscure third brother, or perhaps just a powerful noble. However, despite Mehadias' obscurity, it is possible to glean at least a hint of his personality from the little evidence we have from his reign. But, from what little we can understand about it, his reign was an incredibly eventful one. One aspect of Mehadias' rule was the implementation of a radical rework of Oxum's currency. In fact, his coins are so distinct in their design that, upon their discovery, archaeologists were initially convinced that they were modern forgeries meant for tourists. Now, coin design admittedly doesn't sound very important. And that's fair. Coins, though, can tell us a lot about the time period, and three of the changes that Mechadias made can tell us a lot about his rule. For starters, his coins have some of the highest gold content of any Oxumite coins ever minted, showing that Oxum's economy was doing really well under his rule. Next, the language on the new coins was changed from Greek to Gaez. Previously, Greek was used on Oxumite coins because they were meant for use only by merchants. Much like how English is the international language of business today, Greek was the international language of trade in antiquity. So, by changing the language on the coins from Greek to Oxum's native language of Gaez, Mechadias was making a clear statement about the health of the economy. Gold coins were no longer used exclusively by merchants, but were now a staple of both foreign and domestic trade. Whether in a crowded international market in Adulis, or in a small farmer's market on the rural outskirts of Oxum, you could see the glimmer of Mehadias' gilded coins. Finally, and most importantly for today's episode, Mehadias completely redesigned the face of his coins, filling them with propagandistics of his new, vehemently Christian state policy. To recall, Christianity had only recently been introduced to Aksum when Mehadias took the throne. Over our last two episodes, Izana had gradually introduced the faith as Aksum's official religion, but had only begun actively trying to spread the faith in the latter half of his reign. Even then, Izana had been careful not to upset the status quo too much. While now a Christian, Izana continued many of the traditions and rituals of the pre-Christian faith. This practice is called syncretism, or combining the practices, faiths, or aesthetic of two different religions. The current Abana, or patriarch of the Oxumite Church, Fermentius, had no problem with syncretism. In fact, he sometimes even actively promoted it, as syncretism made it easier to convert people to a faith that was more familiar to them. So, throughout Azana's reign, while Christianity spread at a respectable pace, many of Aksum's pre-Christian pagan religious practices continued unmolested. Many of the popular prayers among the peasantry sounded suspiciously similar to the old prayers to the war god Maher. And it wouldn't be uncommon in ancient Aksum to see a Christian man go to church one day, then see that same man make an offering to the pagan god Ishtar the next. However, while Fermentius and Azana were perfectly happy with syncretic Christianity, many within the Aksumite church were not. It wasn't uncommon to see other Christians lash out at these practices as pagan rituals that ought to be done away with. 
and, based on what evidence we have about him, Mechadius was a strong supporter of the latter view. Mechadius used the printing of coins as an opportunity to loudly proclaim his Christian faith. On the backside of Mechadius' coins, an angel clutches a crucifix in his hand. On the front, the halo that used to encircle the Oxumite king's head, a vestigial pagan symbol of the king's divine ancestry, was done away with. While Azana's coins had included the secular slogan of May this please the people, Mechadius inscribed an overtly religious slogan, By this cross you shall conquer. Once atop the throne of Oxum, the primary item on Mechadius' agenda was the true Christianization of his empire. He began a state-run purge of pagan iconography and practices. Temples to the god Ishtar were demolished, making offerings to the old gods was prohibited, and the erection of stele to mark graves was made illegal. While he wouldn't dare to go out and topple the already erected stele of Oxum's beloved past kings, Mechadius went out of his way to neglect their maintenance, and the grave markers of Oxum's past kings gradually began to topple. However, in his campaign against syncretism, Mechadius ran into one major obstacle, the church. While a faction of Oxumite church officials agreed strongly with the king's crusade against pagan practices, most were frankly indifferent on the matter, including the Abuna Fermentius. Now, Fermentius was not actively opposed to the king's campaign against syncretism. While syncretism had been a useful tool in spreading the Christian faith, Fermentius viewed it as just that, a tool, not anything he dogmatically supported. However, as he didn't really see a problem with syncretism, he wasn't going to go out of his way to enforce the king's crusade either. Mechadius was peeved by Fermentius' lack of effort in fighting paganism, to say the least, but there was nothing he could do about it. Fermentius was a beloved figure, the religious father of the people, so Mechadius couldn't just hand him a pink slip and tell him to leave. So, for most of his reign, Mechadius had to tolerate a church which was ambivalent at best towards his agenda. However, while Fermentius was beloved, he was not immortal. In the year 383, 23 years into Mechadius' reign, and almost seven decades since he had arrived in Oxum, Fermentius passed away. We're not sure exactly when he was born, but given that he was likely a teenager while tutoring the young Azana, he was probably well into his 80s when he passed on. When Fermentius died, Mechadius saw an opportunity. While the Oxumite Empire mourned the death of their beloved Abuna, Mechadius was plotting an opportunity. After struggling for decades to get the church to do what he wanted, he figured this whole thing would just be so much easier if he just, you know, took control of the church himself. So, when church officials came to the king to ask him who he would appoint as the new Abuna, his response was, nobody. For the remainder of Mehadius' reign, the position of Abuna remained empty. Instead, church authorities reported directly to the king. Until his death, Mechadius ruled Oxum not only as king, but as the absolute religious authority of the Oxumite Empire. However, until his death turned out not to be such a long time. Seven years after the death of Fermentius, Mechadius followed him into the afterlife. Mechadius' campaign against the old religion of Oxum appears to have been successful. There's no evidence of any major attempts to return to the old polytheistic ways and most of the syncretic traditions that Mechadius railed against would remain dead for the rest of history. There were no subsequent controversies or campaigns against pagan practices. That's just how successful his campaign was against their removal. However, Mechadius' reform to centralize the church beneath the king would not outlive his reign. Upon his death, a man named Uzebas succeeded him. Given the length of their reigns, Uzebas was significantly younger than Mechadius, meaning that he was most likely either his son or nephew. The new king of Oxum is, like his predecessor, fairly obscure. However, what little evidence exists of his reigns indicates that he abandoned his predecessor's policy of aggressively pushing Christianization and reverted to the moderate stance of Azana. His coins abandoned Mechadius' intense Christian themes and revived Azana's old slogan of May this please the people. Additionally, Ozebas ended the practice of the king possessing direct authority over the church. He also went to work attempting to mend the religious and diplomatic relationship between Oxum and its northern neighbor, the Roman Empire. You see, the Oxumites had, ever since their conversion to Christianity, had remained staunchly Nicene in their outlook. They believed in the existence of a co-equal trinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Rome, on the other hand, was a little more complicated. 
While most of its population followed the Nicene sect, a significant minority believed in Arianism, a sect of Christianity that rejected the co-equal trinity. Throughout much of Isana's reign in Oxum, this Arian minority took power in Rome, causing a religious rift between the two nations. And then, as if things weren't weird enough already, the Romans briefly returned to paganism during the reign of Mechadius, which, well, didn't last very long. And then, in 363, the Roman church once again returned to a belief in Nicene Christianity. With the differences between the churches reconciled, Ozebas wrote to the Patriarch of Alexandria. In his quest for absolute rule over the church, Ozebas' predecessor had delegated all the important church functions to himself. This meant that, Despite their intense personal religious devotion, the religious authorities in Oxum had no experience in being the religious heads of anything larger than a city. In this vacuum of qualified leaders that Mechadius had created, Uzebas requested that the Patriarch of Alexandria appointed a new Abuna. This began a long-standing tradition that would continue for centuries, in which the Patriarch of Alexandria would appoint the head of the Ethiopian church. The Patriarch, of course, agreed to Uzebas' request and sent an Egyptian appointee who resumed the policies of the old Abuna Fermentius. Maybe he just wasn't that interested or personally committed to his faith, or maybe he just got tired of all the responsibilities it entailed. However, it's possible that it was motivated by Uzebas being distracted by another, more important matter of state. In the year 390, the foreign policy of the Middle East was defined by one clash between civilizational giants. Throughout the rule of Mehadias, the Roman and Sassanid Persian empires had been embroiled in a massive struggle power throughout the entire Middle East, with the two settling into something of a Cold War mentality. Oxum, from their long history of trade connections and shared religion, made the easy decision to side with the Romans in this tense geopolitical standoff. The Kingdom of Himyar, just across the Red Sea from Oxum, had no such easy choice. The Himyarites traded extensively with both the Romans and the Persians, so they were reluctant to choose sides. While the Romans were Christian, the Persians practiced a faith called Zoroastrianism. Fortunately for the king of Himyar, a third option presented itself. Himyar already possessed a large Jewish population. So, in order to maintain his neutrality, the king of Himyar converted, not to Christianity or Zoroastrianism, but instead to Judaism. However, this change in religion came with a new set of problems for the Himyarites. In a sort of reversal of what happened in Aksum under Zana's rule, Himyar's conversion to Judaism angered its sizable Christian minority. The center of Christianity in southern Arabia lay in the city of Najran. Now, the Aksumite relationship with the people of Najran was a long one. If you'll recall, when Gadrat's invasion of southern Arabia began to fail, Najran was the only territory that stayed consistently loyal to Aksum. In Arheba and Datwinas' campaign in the region, Najrani volunteers made up the bulk of the Aksumite army. Since then, both Aksum and the Najranis have embraced Christianity, making them more than just longtime allies, but also brothers in faith. The Christian Najranis, fearing what they saw as inevitable persecution, rose up in revolt against Himyar. And of course, they called for aid from their longtime African ally. However, Aksumite intervention in this conflict was risky. Since the failed wars of Datwinas more than a century prior, Aksum had quit meddling in Arabian affairs, viewing it as a matter that was simply out of their concern. In fact, in the century that had passed since they had last met in battle, Himyar had become something of an ally to the Aksumites, proving to be a reliable partner in combating the pirates that frequented the Gulf of Aden. This decision must have been a hard one for Uzebas to take. Would he betray his fellow Christians and forfeit an opportunity to once again establish an Aksumite foothold in Arabia? Or would he betray his Arabian ally just to aid some revolt that would probably fail anyways? After a long period of consideration, Uzebas chose the former. He readied a fleet and army, with the goal to land on the Arabian coast and march to Najran to assist the locals with their rebellion. His son, Aeon, was appointed to lead this intervention, and a fleet of ships began to carry Aksumite armies across the Red Sea. They successfully made their way to Najran, reaching the city just in time to break the Himyarite siege. While the details of this campaign are lost to time, it appears that neither side was able to score a decisive victory against the other. Realizing that victory would reach neither side, Aeon and Uzebas agreed to peace with the Himyarite king. Najran would remain a Himyarite territory, 
but the residents would be exempt from conversion. To enforce this agreement, Aksumite soldiers would be allowed to garrison in the city of Najran. This compromise didn't really satisfy anyone, and would ruin the relationship between Aksum and Himyar for the foreseeable future, but it would maintain the peace for now. Uzebas's reign started a status quo that endured in Aksum for the next hundred years. The remainder of the 5th century was a time of quiet prosperity in Aksum. Throughout the rule of the next several Aksumite kings, the status quo of uneasy peace with the Himyarites, the maintenance of economic prosperity, and the preservation of a conservative Nicene theology remained in place. However, this tranquil status quo would soon be interrupted by a brewing theological controversy that would split the Christian world asunder, and would change the history of Oxum forever. Isaac Newton once said that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. In response to the decline of Arianism and other heterodox sects of Christianity that depicted Christ as a human figure, inferior to the Holy Father, a faction within the Nicene Church adopted a radical theological opposition to this view. This faction, which had become known as the Meophysites, believed that Christ had one nature, which was primarily divine, but contained elements of humanity. This clashed with the more mainline Nicene view, that Christ had two distinct natures, one of which was divine and the other human. Now, I know that this is confusing and seems rather esoteric and unimportant to us today, but this was a really big deal at the time. Christianity was still a relatively new religion, and was still trying to settle on an official church doctrine. A deviation from the mainline view could create discord and infighting within Christendom, as we saw with the Arianism controversy, so divergent views were strongly discouraged. Which side of these esoteric debates he fell on could result in a priest losing his title, becoming exiled, or in some cases, even death. To settle this theological dispute, the Roman Empire called an ecumenical council at the city of Chalcedon, where they would decide an official church doctrine on the matter. There, in the year 451, they sided with the mainline view, and affirmed that Christ had two separate natures. Now, in reality, that opinion isn't really that different from the Neophysite opinion. Apart from semantics, is there really that much of a difference between one nature with two segments and having two natures? This is where we can begin to question the motive behind the Council of Chalcedon. You see, the hotbed of Meophysitism had always been located in Egypt, especially in the areas surrounding Alexandria. The city of Alexandria, in addition to being a hotbed of Meophysitism, was also one of the three most important cities in Roman Christianity. Decades ago, at the Council of Nicaea, it was declared that three cities, Alexandria, Rome, and Antioch, would have religious primacy over all others. The bishops of these three cities enjoyed immense power and prestige within their spheres of political influence, becoming known as the Patriarchs. This made sense at first, as these were the most important cities in early Christianity, but this quickly became problematic for the Romans. After all, their capital was now in Constantinople, a city which didn't have a patriarchate of its own, so the emperors had a hard time controlling these faraway religious authorities. Perhaps not so coincidentally, in addition to proclaiming the Opposatism to be a heresy, the council also declared that two new cities would receive the same primacy, Jerusalem and Constantinople. Additionally, the aftermath of the council saw the Romans try, and fail, to replace the Patriarch of Alexandria with one more loyal to the emperor, all under the guise of weeding out the Meophysite heresy. Something's kind of fishy here, which leads me to believe that the Council of Chalcedon was not motivated by genuine theological disagreement, but was a thinly veiled religious power grab by the Roman Emperor and the Bishop of Constantinople. But regardless of its intentions, the Council of Chalcedon initiated a full-scale persecution of Meophysites throughout the empire. In Egypt, this persecution failed because the Meophysites absolutely dominated the church there, but throughout the rest of the empire, where Meophysite priests were a minority, they were expelled from their careers. Fleeing as refugees, these Meophysite priests and ministers poured into the nearby kingdom of Armenia, or south into Egypt. A few, however, chose to flee even further south, to the kingdom of Aksum. These Meophysite refugees trickled into Aksum gradually throughout the late 5th century, and came from all over the Mediterranean. Some hailed from Syria, others from Italy, Anatolia, Egypt, or Greece. 
The Abana of Oxum was himself appointed by the Patriarch of Alexandria. He himself was an Egyptian Miophysite. So, when the king of Oxum went to him wondering what he should do with these refugees, he told them that he should let them take up residence. Nine of these priests were appointed by the Abuna to important positions within the church. As previously stated, the Christian faith in Oxum had largely stagnated into a conservative status quo over the last century. Since the rule of Mechadius, and the subsequent undoing of his many reforms, Oxumite Christian practice and theology had changed little. While Fermentius and his disciples had been successful in spreading Christianity, they had spread a version of Christianity that was easy for newcomers to accept. This early form of Oxumite Christianity was fairly rudimentary, lacking a strong religious doctrine, church hierarchy, or an extensive literary tradition. Seeking to further develop the Oxumite Church, the nine new priests set about building churches, training ministers, initiating a long-lasting monastic tradition, and writing church literature. Their efforts would build the foundation of what would become the Tawahedo, or East African Orthodox Church, and for their efforts are revered to this day as the Nine Saints. One of the saints, Abba Garima, produced the Garima Gospels. This book contained various illuminated manuscripts, as well as apostolic portraits of the apostles Mark, Matthew, and John. While the exact date of its creation is hotly debated, it's considered to be on the short list of the potential oldest illuminated manuscript ever created. Since the day it was written, this manuscript has resided in the Abagarima Monastery near modern-day Adwa, Ethiopia. I will, of course, be posting pictures of this fascinating work of art to the podcast's associated blog. Another of the saints, Abba Arigawi, built the now-famous Debredamo Monastery. This monastery, which rests isolated at the top of a steep plateau, is only accessible by climbing a sheer cliffside. In this isolated locale, the monks of Debredamo have maintained many of the best-preserved works of Christian literature in the entire world. To this day, the Nine Saints remain an important facet of East African Christianity. To many Tawahedo practitioners, they are symbols of the ideal Christian, living as humble hermits and dedicating their lives to religious devotion. Traditions they established are still respected by the Eritrean and Ethiopian churches to this day, and the monasteries and churches they created were essential to the continued flourishing of Oxumite Christianity. The monasteries established by the Nine Saints would serve as centers of Oxumite thought for the remainder of the Empire's lifespan, and even beyond. However, I would like to add a disclaimer to the story of the Nine Saints. Unfortunately, some use the crucial legacy that these important foreigners left on the church to argue that Oxumite, and therefore the later Tawahedo Christianity, are foreign imports. Basically, that because refugees from the Byzantine world brought these traditions to East Africa, that the civilizational achievements of Oxumite Christianity cannot be attributed to East Africans, but rather to foreigners. However, I think this sentiment is entirely unconvincing. Because, while the Nine Saints themselves may have been a foreign stock, the monks and priests who they trained were Oxumite. The only thing harder than the creation of traditions is their maintenance, and not only did the monks and priests of Oxum maintain the tradition of the Nine Saints, but they refined it even further. While the Nine Saints led the initial renaissance of the Oxumite Church, it was indigenous priests and monks who would do the legwork in ensuring its continued survival in practice. Saint Yared, for example, was an Oxumite student of the Nine Saints. Yared is responsible for the creation of the Zema, a type of liturgical chant used by the Tawahedo Church to this day. You've been listening to one of these chants, Maleteski, throughout this section of the episode. Yerid is but one example among many of how, throughout more than a millennium of its existence, the practitioners of the Tawahedo Church have not only maintained, but refined the church into a unique organization to call their own. The 5th and early 6th centuries were a period of great civilizational progress in terms of art, religion, and culture. However, we have still not quite reached the point in Oxumite history that can rightly be called its peak. Oxum's next king would lead the empire to the true peak of its power, avenge the failed campaigns of his predecessors of southern Arabia, and would even become revered as a saint as far away as Europe to this day. Join us next week as we learn about the life and times of Oxum's most famous king, Caleb. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so by supporting us at patreon.com slash historyofafrica, by giving us a review on iTunes, 
or by sharing the show to anyone who you think might be interested. This episode of the History of Africa is brought to you by Sandro, one of our supporters on Patreon. Thank you very much for your support, Sandro. It helps us keep the show running and is appreciated immensely.